Drea, welcome. We've been talking a lot lately. I was just on your podcast. Now you're on Becoming the Channel. So welcome. We're so happy to have you here. So excited to talk to you for the third time in a row this week, Robin. <laughs> what a pleasure. You all, we were saying before we started recording, what are we going to do when we're not talking every day? But we find other ways to stay connected. This is Becoming the Channel, Drea, as you know, and I love to talk about all things energetics, channeling higher frequencies, including wealth consciousness. But I always love to start with this because my guests are all profoundly intuitive as we know you are. So I have a couple questions from when you were a little kid. Perfect. When you were little, what did you tell people you wanted to be when you grew up? A singer, uh, a cake baker, uh, a cop, and a doctor <laughs> all at the same time. All at the same time. <laughs> All the same time. How did you make sense of that in your brain? Because I'm sure you knew that was a lot all at the same time. Like, how did you, how would your day go with all of those roles? I mean, I think, I think I just always saw something like I saw something that looked really good to me. And I was like, I want to do that. Or I want to do that. And it just, it was all over the place. But I think at the very end of my more like into high school, I was like, I want to be an attorney. That was the big, big main thing. Mm -hmm. What did you study when you went to? college advertising and business okay so you moved away from being an attorney at that point <laughs> yes I realized how much uh how much school was required and I just didn't want to do that totally get it what okay so when you were little you wanted to be all of those things I'm assuming you also felt pretty different from everybody else did you have any intuitive moments or moments that really just stand out for you when you were little about like wow I see the world way differently than other people. Yeah. You know, when I was in fourth grade, that's, I really started writing poetry and me and my friend, we, we still have these notebooks that have, I mean, at the time, of course, we thought they were very philosophical, but they really went deep into life's questions and just, why are we here? I was always asking, why am I here? What's my purpose? And I, I've always been very purpose-driven since fourth grade, which is crazy when I think about it. Like if I met a fourth grader asking, what is my purpose and really being purpose-driven, like, wow, it's, yeah. So I would say that's really the biggest thing is just always being really purpose-driven and always being, I have always been very intuitive with the way people feel. I've always been, um, yeah, just knowing, knowing how people feel like I, I love making people laugh. And so I think that came at a young age, knowing how to get people to laugh and just understand like, oh, if I, if I do, if I, if I deliver a joke this way, then I can get them to laugh or this way, then they'll, they'll like it more. That's fascinating. That, that goes beyond intuitive intel or uh, emotional intelligence and gets into like hyper empathy, being able to really find the sweet spot for your audience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to put a pin in that because I want to come back to that when we talk about the energetics of social media, because I get a sense that you're probably still using that sixth sense to this day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we'll come back to that for sure. I can't wait. That's going to be cool. Let's talk. Next thing I want to just touch on from so our audience can get to know you better is that you have a couple of really important stories in your life already game-changing moments in your life. Can you share just a, some of your background and what brings you here to this place in your life today? Some of those important moments, particularly around mental health, well-being, and finding yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, really quick, Robin. Is it, I'm gonna, um, I totally forgot to record. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, so my mental health journey started well, obviously when I was very young, but my parents, it was, I would say I definitely grew up in a, an amazing household. My parents were both loving towards me, but not loving towards themselves and towards each other. And that was really, really hard for me to see, especially, especially being empathic and taking in those emotions. And so I think a lot of my stress for my life for sure started when I was in a, a child. But when it really started in terms of my professional experience was when I was in the corporate world and I was, I, I became really successful really, really fast. 
and it got to my head. I had a big ego at the time. I was obsessed with money. Um, and, you know, I, I was able to walk through the sales floor and everyone stops what they're doing and looks at you like that type of that type of success. It was really it was just something that I never really thought I would get so young in life and I could buy anything I wanted. And it was just um, it was a lot very quickly. And it I, I it led to burnout for me. I I got to a point where I was not able to work anymore because it manifested like all of my stress and everything manifested into getting I got carpal tunnel and then I got thoracic outlet syndrome. And I I like, yeah, I literally could not work. And so I couldn't work for I think it was like six months or so. But I lost my identity, completely lost my identity, because my whole identity was wrapped up in being successful and being this corporate world and being this top salesperson. And once I lost that identity, I didn't know what to do with myself. I lost my purpose, right? Like we we go back to my childhood. I was so driven. I was so driven by my purpose. Even when I was a top salesperson, I was so driven by just being the top salesperson. I was so driven by being so competitive. And then I lost all of it. And it was just, it's so funny when you look back on things it's so meant to be, but I was meant to lose everything that I knew that I was or that, that I thought that I was at the time. And so I um, lost 22 pounds in a month. I was just waking and baking every single day, just nonstop weed. Um, mm. I just was not taking care of myself at all. And I started having panic attacks almost every single day, like crazy, like full blown panic attacks where I thought I was thought I was dying. I kept going to the doctors, ask, asking what is going on with me, what's happening. Like they kept doing blood tests. And I was just convinced that I had some type of brain tumor. Something was really wrong with me. And finally, it got so bad where I like well, shut all of my friends out. I didn't talk to anybody. Um, and I called the doc. I, I called. 911 and I had them pick me up, took me to a hospital. And I was, I mean, that's a whole nother story, but basically they admitted me into a psychiatric hospital. And um, yeah, from there I spent, I think I spent like it's it's so blurry. All this this whole time in my life is so blurry. I'd say like for two or three months of my life, super blurry, where I have to call up my best friend, like, what the heck happened then? But um What were so, the symptoms yeah. that you were experiencing when? they decided to admit you? Well, they they said that I was bipolar from just like one, they just looked, took a look at me and what was happening. I actually didn't sleep for about like very, like maybe a few hours of sleep for like four or five days. And then I took a ton of sleeping. My my boyfriend at the time took gave me double the dose of sleeping medication. So then I was like very out of it, but they said I was bipolar and um. And I charged a nurse actually was the main reason. I don't even remember doing this, but I I thought they were trying to kill me when I was in the, the hospital. And so I think I was just, I wasn't like trying to hurt her. I just, just, I wanted to leave. And so I just ran and I think I just like chart, like mm -hmm. charged her. So um, that's why they admitted me <laughs> into the psychiatric hospital because of all this, a lot of, yeah, all that, that whole episode. Well, I want to thank you for being so transparent about that, because one of the things that I know for sure about highly creative, highly intuitive people is that often we bump up against these mental health symptoms, even to the point of being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, paranoia, delusions, and that kind of thing. And, you know, you know, it's multifaceted and it can also, unless we've seen you, you guys, you took the Neo a couple of days ago. And so I've seen your pro your personality profile and knowing what I know about your personality profile, I can see where there would be that, especially with your high openness score, just that heightened imagination. And if you're anxious all the time and having panic attacks, the filter, the channel through which you're viewing the world is going to be distorted by the nervous system and what's going on in your physical body. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right. Because I had one of the symptoms was me having grandiose vi views of my of my life and just who I was mm -hmm. and how I that I was supposed to change the world like massively. Mm -hmm. Well, you are. And, yeah. you know, it's like when you get in certain contexts, I'll give this example. I have a, a dear friend of mine um, is bipolar and he was having a manic episode. And he's very intuitive. 
And he kept on telling people he was from the star system, the Pleiades. He kept on pointing to the Pleiades in the sky saying he was from there. And I said to him later, I said, yes, you are, but you can't say that to people in normal conversations. So it's like that the, the, the mental, uh, emotional resiliency that's required, like the filters are required in order to function in the world. And when those come down because of burnout or a, some kind of break like that, it can look like it can get pretty messy in terms of people understanding what you're talking about. I love that so much. Yeah, you're, it's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Because we know on this side of it, well, I know that you are actually meant to change the world and you've been doing a lot of that, but under those circumstances, and you're not the first person who I've run into who's had a very interesting profile, neo profile like yours, and has also had an experience of either being hospitalized or diagnosed with a really significant mental illness and also have been profoundly psychic and intuitive. Yeah. It's funny because I actually told the doctors that I was psychic when I was mm -hmm. in there and I still haven't fully tapped into those psychic abilities to this day, but it just, it's funny that you are saying mm -hmm. this and I literally told them that and mm -hmm. that was one of the symptoms they put down for me. And the truth is that if I had been there, I would have believed you. <laughs> and there are other ways of managing and understanding our abilities without, you know, I don't, I wasn't there, so I don't know all of the details of it, but I always think about like, if the people who were actually profoundly intuitive and also had the, whatever was going on with them that created a destabilization in their sense of reality or their sense of being able to filter, um, their experience would be quite different yeah. in coming out on the other side of that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I'm reflecting on my own experience. I had a lot of trauma that I had to process through. Like 12 years ago, I was laying on a yoga mat in Shavasana at the end, having a panic attack. And my clinical brain was like, I'm watching myself have this panic attack laying in Shavasana thinking, why in the world would a person be panicking laying in Shavasana? And then all of a sudden it hit me that I had all of this childhood trauma that transcended just my trauma, but also it was genetic and generational as well that I was processing through. And there were points, my therapist actually told me one time, he said, I thought I was going to have to hospitalize you, but I handled it well enough. I kept my shit together well enough that I didn't have to be hospitalized. We're good at that, aren't we? <laughs> Well, it goes to intellect. Yeah. When you have a fast brain in your head, you can mask a lot of the symptoms because you just deploy your intellectual resources to cover for that part of you that's feeling a little off or a little different or a little wild or untethered until it just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, what, what occurs to you about that? that that's 100% what I was doing. Cause I remember us talking about that, I think during the Neo and it just, it was like, yep, that's exactly what I was doing when I honestly, the majority of my life, <laughs> the yeah. majority, the twice exceptionality, the capacity to cover for your, any kind of difference, whether it's ADHD, dyslexia, a mood disorder, anxiety, depression, trauma, when you've got a fast brain in your head and you've got the capacity to just de deploy your intellectual resources, it shifts, it, it, it covers for you until you just can't anymore. And I've seen that happen over and over and over with very bright people who are also highly creative and intuitive. Yeah, I could totally see that. So when you came out of that, what happened next? So I was still in the psychiatric hospital when I was, I mean, not that I really came out of it, but I just remember sitting there. I was around all these people that I never thought that I would be around. I mean, like, yeah, really. Like, like the real crazy people. And like, yeah. like, yeah. And, and everyone, it was like everyone. And I just never thought I'd be there. And, and no one else did either. And, and you're, you're oh, this is so perfect, but you're totally right. I kept it together so well throughout my entire life that people 
that found out that I was in there just could not believe it. My parents couldn't believe it. My friends couldn't believe it. Every like I, it was cra- it was crazy to everybody and even to myself. But I just knew like shit, things aren't working. Something's not working in my life and I need to do something differently with my life. The choices I'm making led me here. I'm so grateful that I took I did take responsibility for that. I I, I can't even believe I did because back then I w- didn't really take responsibility for anything. And so I told myself I could make this the most pivotal moment of my, of my entire life or make myself a victim and make this, again, the most pivotal moment of my entire life, but not in a good way. And so thankfully, I chose to make it the best thing that ever happened in my life. And it really, to this day, it still is. And I'll never forget that one single moment that I made that decision. And I really made that decision. And then I got out. Um, I was convinced I was bipolar. I'm not, but I was convinced I was. Um, so that was like a, another identity shift where, you know, I am bipolar where you, you tell yourself yeah. and my parents were like, I don't think you are like, that doesn't make any sense. Like you didn't show any, any other signs. I was like, I am, I am. But anyways, I, I finally got over that. And I went to a psychiatrist. They told me I wasn't, you know, like they, sometimes they will just tell you something to, to make, the diagnosis. <laughs> well, I mean, given the circumstances, and I've shared this with other people who have had your experience is unique. And so there have been a couple of other people who have similar profiles to you who have had similar experiences. And given the circumstances and given the information at hand, there can be that moment of looking at what's the best way of explaining these symptoms. And that was the diagnosis that was put on in order to describe a cluster of symptoms that looked a whole lot like that. And it occurs to me, you said you, it was wake and bake for you for a long time. I've run into people who have a paradoxical reaction to pot. They become, become profoundly anxious to the point of even hallucinating sometimes. And so I think that that's an interesting question mark as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the hallucinations were absolutely happening for me and um, just delusional. Mm-hmm. I, I was delusional with my own reality, completely delusional. And you just don't know it because you're always in that state of mind. And I, I don't even touch, I don't even touch, not that I'm against it, but I don't touch marijuana anymore because I, I like reality. I like to be so clear headed and in, in, in my reality. And I know what happens when I'm not. Yeah. So interesting. So you have this pivotal moment. And when you're telling me this story, I'm seeing like this timeline split, like there was a crossroads and you're like, do I go here or do I go here? And it was a very conscious choice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Super conscious. I mean, for the most part, because after that, it wasn't, it wasn't all uphill from there. It was very, you know, hilly and, but I, yeah, I made that choice. And then after that, that choice led me to going, selling all of my stuff and traveling the world for, it was like eight years on and off for eight years and just traveling mostly third world countries, which was incredible and volunteering for ayahuasca shamans in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. I did meditation retreats um, for like 10 days, no looking or talking to anybody, no phone, nothing, just literally meditating basically all day long. Um, and I just, I really tried to find every spiritual experience I possibly could because I was committed to myself of finding myself. Cause like that really, it did really come to that point where I was in my parents' basement after everything happened. Cause I kind of moved back in cause I, I just needed like some time to, to relax, but I was at 3am in the morning and I was Googling how to be happy. I did not know how to be happy. I just like, I, I didn't even Robin, I didn't even believe it existed. I didn't even think happiness existed. And and I, and I, like, I was like, prove it to me, prove me that happiness exists. And so I was really Googling it. And I I came up with all these articles and one of them said, get out of your comfort zone. And so that's why I chose to start traveling and get out of my comfort zone. I really did. Like, I, I mean, I stayed in some places that were totally out of my comfort zone and um, did experiences totally out of my comfort zone. I never, up to that point, I'd never meditated in my life. I didn't even know what Buddhism was. I, I didn't know any of anything. And so I just, I literally went with the intention of finding myself and I'm still in the process. <laughs> I think it's, it's a, a 100% a journey, but I mean, you saw my Neo the, just when you said, is it the wanderlust? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The wanderlust. Yes. Yes. And then like just the neuroticism as well, like being, being so low, like I, I worked my butt off 
to, uh-huh. you know, to really get there. Cause it's just, just, yeah, looking at my life eight years ago is 100% the opposite. I couldn't even have a conversation with you right now. I'm not kidding. I could not have more than a minute conversation with you, like a full conversation without me do, doing very canned responses. Like, oh, really? Oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just really canned because I didn't, I could not comprehend conversation because I was always somewhere else. I was always thinking about something else. I just, I had so much anxiety that I just could not be grounded in the moment ever because I didn't feel safe in the moment. I felt safe somewhere else. <laughs> not in your body. Not in my body ever. So I want to give some context to our listeners. In the Neo personality profile, there's one factor called neuroticism, which is just sen- how sensitive are you to stress and how emotionally reactive are you? So it's all brain-based and it's things like anxiety, depression, anger, self-consciousness, impulsivity, the need to self-soothe during times of frustration. And then the last one is just how sensitive are you to stress? And so when we were doing your Neo, your like your neuroticism, your nervous system is so solid at this point. It was fascinating to see that. And then for to know the contrast, right? To know where you came from in terms of the anxiety and the the probably impulsivity, I would guess would be there too, and sensitivity to stress with what you were going through. Neuroticism is one of the most malleable of all of the personality characteristics because we can do the things that you've done, the, the brain-based meditation and all of the, the personal growth that you've done has created this new, basically this new channel for your consciousness to run through. And so your story actually gives a ton of hope to those people who are anxious and depressed and have impulsivity and are just really sensitive to energy and emotions. It's like this story And you're living, breathing testament to the fact that you actually can change your brain and nervous system. So thank you for being that ray of hope. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely possible. And, um, I always tell people meditate, (laughs) meditate. And I mean, there's so many things you can do. Yeah. And that's one of the things that as you've come back from your eight years traveling, which also has changed your brain, I imagine, tremendously, just being out in the world, doing different things. What happened What happened next? When did you start sharing this message? Because I know that you're a messenger for sure. Yeah, so I came back and I got a job back in sales, but was for a much better company than I was before. But it was only for, I, I think I was there for maybe even a year but I manifested, I manifested getting laid off for COVID because COVID happened. I got laid off and I, I, I asked the universe, I was like, give me a social media platform that I can share my message. Cause I knew I wanted to share this message. Exactly. The one you were just saying, like, just like how that you don't have to be depressed, that you don't have to be anxious, that you don't have to have these horrible feelings all the time. And someone said, TikTok in the grocery store the next day. I was like, what is that? <laughs> what is this TikTok? And so I went back to my place. I downloaded TikTok. I spent two weeks on it and I just absorbing what the heck it was. I posted my first three videos. They were meditation bowl videos. So just singing bowl uh, videos. And um, I didn't tell one person. I didn't even tell my boyfriend at the time. And I went and I went on a backpacking trip, didn't have any service, came back and one of my videos went viral. And it just, it, it was like this confirmation from the universe that I need to keep going. And it was just, it was just a huge, just like kick in the butt. And then I, I uploaded a video almost every single day for the next four, I think it was four months or so, or five months. And, uh, I quickly, I got, I, it was crazy. I, um, like the, I remember the first week I got like 4,000 followers. I was like, what is going on? This is crazy. And then, yeah. And then I, it got up to, over 600,000 followers, almost 700,000 followers in four months. And it was just, it was just, uh, before that I didn't do any social media. You know, I didn't, it just, it just felt like there's no way I can make money doing what I love type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And and I was, I was able to lead live meditations to like 43, 45,000 people at a time. And every time I went live, I had, you know, hundreds to thousands of people watching me live every time. And it was just, it was one of those things where I felt so aligned for the first time in my life, doing what I love and doing 
doing something that I actually have experienced because I didn't I never pretended I was someone who I wasn't until maybe a little later in my TikTok career because I think I got a little bit unaligned but it was just it was a massive confirmation for that and then long story short I I did I did start feeling unaligned with my content I was like man I love business I love sales that's what I've been doing since my goodness my dad was an entrepreneur so I grew up with that and I've been doing sales since I was like 16 and marketing and business I just I love it I really think it's the most one of the most beautiful things ever when you use it as a tool like that and so um I I stopped posting on my social media and I just started doing business courses and 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 coaching and all of this and I started my own TikTok agency um that was six, very successful very quickly it was a full service agency we did everything for people like you would literally just get in front of the camera and record we would give you scripts we would have video a whole video editing team copywriters all this stuff and then we post you everywhere and so did that and uh but I went the other way where that didn't feel aligned because it was only business and people didn't come to me for any spirituality or anything with their emotions and it was really hard to work with some people because so as you know <laughs> so many entrepreneurs and coaches and and uh, they they have those emotions still and they, they like we all have them i still have them i still have them even though my neuroticism is apparently low i still mm -hmm. have it so it was um so i i really had to take a step back from that too and i just i've been burning my businesses to the ground like one after another but now i'm more of in a transition phase where i'm i'm molding and marrying both my spirituality and my business marketing skills together and so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm so excited to talk with you about that. Because here's the thing, a lot of my listeners, a lot of the people in my audience are such gifted healers, transformational coaches, know the energetics so well of their work privately. And they bump up against visibility issues in social. They bump up against, you know, the who am I, kind of the imposter syndrome stuff. They bump oh, up yeah. against things like, well, there are so many other people out there who are doing really good work. What is my space? What is my role here? And you and I can see it, but I would love to get, you know, your thoughts and your perspective on the energetics of social media and how you've married the lessons you've learned along the way, first of all, and how you've married them now and going forward in your business. Yeah, that's an amazing question. I, I'm I'm still every day is different. And every day, I'm still doing that. And it's, it's, it's a constant, you have to realize it's a constant journey. But the main thing truly, truly, truly is to feel aligned with what you're doing. I really believe that with all of my heart. And just because if you share content, when you don't feel 100% aligned, you will attract the wrong people. And that's what I did when I was first had my social media account. Yes, I got to over 600,000 followers fast, but there was a time where I was pulling in followers that were not aligned with me at all. It was a lot of people who were massively suffering, massively. And that's not, I'm not equipped to deal with that. Like I'm not trauma informed. I don't, I, I just don't feel comfortable dealing with that. And, but I knew, but at the time I knew that was going to get me the views, right? And I knew that was going to get me the followers. And so I did that, but not from be having a poor intention. It was just like, I, I, I was just going with it at the wrong intention. And so it's really being aligned with what you like your values. And before every single video asking, am I aligned? Like, is this really what I want to share with the world? And not is this, is this what this other girl is sharing? And she just got a ton of views. And this just went really, really well. And like, do I kind of understand it? Like, no, do you really does this feel so passionate? so beautiful in your heart that you can't wait to share this message. It's like, you're literally sharing it from overflow. Or are you sharing it because you have to share it because the algorithm says you have to share one to two videos every single day. And now you're sharing from a space of feeling empty and, and feeling like crap. And it's really like you have to continue to keep intentional to keep aligned and, and, and to keep balanced. I've seen I mean, I've been doing this since it doesn't sound like long, but it kind of is for video it, since 2020. And that's, I have seen so many people, including myself, burn out over and over and over again with this video content stuff. And so you have to find something that you know that you, that you absolutely love and that you can sustain for years because it really is about consistency. You have to stay consistent if you want to be successful with what we're doing here. 
it is be, being consistent with your message because people don't trust people who are not consistent. If you show up one week and then you don't show up another week, they're not going to trust you. It doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel good, but I'm not saying you can actually take a few weeks out. I shouldn't say weeks, but I'm saying, I'm talking about months, kind of like, that's what I did. So and I'm, this is coming from experience, but really consistency, alignment, and finding a balance, finding a schedule that, that really does feel good. That again, sharing from overflow it has to be from overflow because if it's not, it's just, you're going to pull in the wrong people and it's not going to lead you down a very pretty path. You either pull in the wrong people or you get crickets. What is what I have found <laughs> is the other. Yes. And, Absolutely. you know, I remember talking about alignment. <clears throat> this is very early on in my career. So I've been in my business for 10 years, but this was like, I'm going to say I was probably still at the university. So it was like, let's say it was 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. And I wrote a blog post on empaths who are healing the world's pain. And it got enough attention that the people who were in severe distress started reaching out to me. And I felt completely overwhelmed by it. I mean, I was a psychologist, but I wasn't licensed to help all of them. And it's that, that feeling of complete, exp for me, it was this feeling of like, what can of worms did I just open and wanting to kind of put the toothpaste back in the tube as fast as possible and really having to learn from that. And that was so early on, but I know that that has continued to influence how I, how I think about socials and like even what I post today and, and so on. And so it's just, it's kind of that, yes, yeah, striking a balance, understanding what you're aligned for. And also, I think there's something about energetic protection and resilience around experiences like that, having something in, in your back pocket that is loving and supportive and helpful to those people without taking on their pain yourself or without taking responsibility for their experiences. Does that make sense? Oh, it, you have to have that. You absolutely, because that's it, it gets really, really heavy when you have hundreds of people messaging you every single day. And actually, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I got to that point where I started feeling bitter when anyone would message me. I'm like, stop taking my energy. Like, get like, you know, these were my followers that I was, you know, feeling this. And I, of course, I didn't show that anywhere because, you know, we're masked. We mask very well. But right. I just if I, it really at the very end got really heavy and really frustrating. And, you know, people would send you these long, long messages wanting all of this healing and and your energy from you and and you feel that and it just feels like su like sucking like people are just predatory you. yeah absolutely or parasitic yeah. yeah yeah so oh my gosh i had something else come through i lost it what else do you want to say about that <laughs> i totally <laughs> lost whatever it was like whoa oh, yeah. i love it I love it. Just, I would say one thing I'd like to touch upon as well, just getting into the right energy and getting into alignment is make that intention before every single video or every single post before you write any single copy. Don't write copy from a place of, of feeling again, feeling lack or feeling like crap that day or feeling angry or whatever you're feeling right from a place of the leader that you are wanting to become of where you want to become, of in, the embodiment of the woman that you want to become, or person, I don't know if, if your audience is mostly women, but the person that you want to become in five years, 10 years, like what leader is that? And then make videos, make content from that place. That is by far the most powerful thing I've ever done in my life. And for sure, it's it's what got has has got me my success today, not just in terms of followers, but you know, financial, all that good stuff. But it's really making sure that you are embodying that person that you want to be, not that person that you are right now. Not that that's a bad person. I totally accept who you are in this moment, but realizing that you really do need to be intentional with that energy. Maybe like for me, it's visualization, meditation, really opening my heart and imagining this, imagining this, these people, this massive amount of people that need my, that need my message. And they're just waiting and, and they're praying on their hands and knees that someone is going to give them this message on their for you page. And I deliver it like, like setting that intention. That. It's like, so it's so powerful. I'm like getting goosebumps. It's yeah. really powerful. Same. And ah, uh, 
Yeah. Same. Well, I talk a lot about channeling your future self, Amazing. Like being, being in the leadership energy. And I think that that's the 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 rub in tech in using technology is that there is this kind of sense of well I have to meet the algorithms and the algorithms and the algorithms and one of my friends Christina Rice always says God is my algorithm like there's something <laughs> I love that <laughs> there's something more than the AI or the tech that that is involved here so I think that the the channeling when we talk about becoming the channel what I'm hearing you say when it comes to the energetics of social media and making a difference and developing a business around the, the marketing in social media is really aligning with your the future version of yourself who has already done that, who has already made the difference. Absolutely. That you know you're here to make. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, 100%, 100%. And this, this empire that you're building or whatever the goal that you are building at this moment, whatever it is, but really embodying that message and not just Again, not just looking at what Sue did that day or what Annie did that day. Thank you. If, for, if you yeah, ha- yeah it, it has to be from you. It has to be because you are the thought leader and no one's going to follow someone who is not, who doesn't have their own thoughts and really is able to embody it. I think that's the biggest thing. It's like, yes, you can learn. You can, ha- you can take Annie's message, but you have to embody Annie's message, like truly embody it. You can't just be like, oh, this sounds really good. And I think it's going to sound really good on video because it doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't. That's when you get those crickets. It's not even that you get fake followers at that moment. That's when you get those crickets because you think it sounds good. I've done, I've done it so many times, you guys, like I've done that so many times where I'm like, oh, that's like, that went viral. That did really well. And I try and make it my own. I'm like, this is going to be so inspiring. And you, you, it, it becomes ego driven. And when it becomes ego driven, it's 100 hundred percent in the wrong. And if you can get in the right intention and embody that future self, embody whatever goal that is, it is dynamite. Like it is dynamite. I love that so much. And let's talk about copying and jealousy. Love it. Yep. <laughs> Not love it, but <laughs> love that but we're talking it's, about that. It's a good, it's a yeah. good part of the conversation. Here's why. Absolutely. When you are empathic, intuitive, you can see what other people are doing, just to your point there, you're like, I can make that my own. I can, what are they doing? And let me make that my own. So that's a, that's a copying. It's a a repetition energy or or a copying energy. Um, And it always falls flat. I want to know what you think about this. What I've been practicing recently is asking, because there are always people who are super inspiring. And I used to ask this, you know, Marie Forleo, you know, Marie, love her. So I wrote a post, I wrote a, a, an email a long time ago. And the headline was, what does Marie have that I don't like what she got that I don't have? Cause I couldn't figure it out. And quite frankly, I used to cry over John Osaroff. Um, you know, do you know who he is? He's the old um, neuroscience guy. I'm like, what is he? I have a PhD in psychology and mindfulness practices. And he's making millions of dollars teaching neuroscience. And he's a business guy. Like, it was just so like, I had no idea, like, all of the things that were going on behind the scenes. But it was always about like, rather than looking at what they were doing is tuning in then to what's the energy behind it? Like what energy are they channeling? What channel are they on? And if we can tap into that energy rather than into their message or into how they're doing it or what they look like or what they're saying, I think that changes things as well. Absolutely. It it activates something inside of you when you can it's, it's, you don't use your thinking brain when you're feeling their video or when you're feeling their copy, you're literally putting your consciousness inside of their copy. You know, like you are literally like your is impasse. This is such, this is like one of the most powerful things I have ever done as far as my business goes, as far as social media goes, is be having the ability to feel because you can feel anything. Everything is energy. If everything's energy, we can't just feel people we can feel videos, we can feel copy. So when you can put your consciousness inside of the freaking energy of the copy, it, it literally, you, you can feel it. And it's like a vortex, oh, I'm getting goosebumps, but it's like a vortex of energy that you can tap into that you can activate inside of yourself. And then you can take and you're not copying, then you're taking this beautiful energy. And then you can write your own copy as long as you stay consistent with that vortex of energy. This is genius. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the only one, but I want to go out and write copy right now from that perspective of being in the vortex, being in the flow. 
and choosing what frequency I'm going to be writing from. Yeah. Yeah. I, I learned that technique when I was editing my own videos. What did you, yeah. how did that work when you're editing your own videos? Yeah. So I started to, I, I love, I love data sometimes. <laughs> and so I would start posting my videos and then I'd be like, okay, why is this one get, why did this one get a hundred thousand views? Why did this one only get 10,000? Okay. Why did this one get 3 million views? Why did this one only get 5,000? You know, and I would, I'd really just analyze, analyze, analyze. And every single video ha carried a certain energy. Every single one. It's crazy. Every single one of my videos that went over a million carries a very specific sign energetic signature. And I could, and that's, and that is the power of being able to feel the copy, being able to feel videos is that you can start to feel that all these other videos have very similar. Well, I shouldn't say certain people have very similar types of energetic signatures with their copy or whatever, but I started to feel the type of energy that my videos needed to have. And so when I edit my video, I didn't even, I edit it with my energy. I literally put my consciousness into my video as I was editing and I'd replay that video. Like, I'm not kidding, probably at least a hundred times. It took me so long to edit my, like, I'd say at least an hour and a half to two hours every video, but I'd really put my energy into the video and, and feel the video. And if, if there's an, any energy that feels a little stagnant or heavy, you'd cut that out or you do something to, to fluff up that energy. You, you just, you, it, it's almost hard to explain over. A no, podcast. it's not. No, no, no. Yeah. I got it. I'm getting it. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm the, getting it's it. So it's power. I, I tell every single one of my clients, you know, and I really teach them to feel your video, you know, cause they ask me, why did this video not do so well? Or why did this video go viral? I'm like, feel the video, like make sure you feel your video. What, what felt different? Why does this one feel like this? And why does this one feel like that? Because again, we're all energy, the algorithms, energy, people going on to the, the for you page, they're just, they're just feeling their energy. They're just feeling all the energy that's going on. And you have to, you have to start to, you, you have your own energetic signature with your videos or with yes. your copy or with your business in general. So if you can feel what that is and you can transmit that into videos, or if you can transmit that into copy or anything else, Oh, you guys get ready. I'm serious. Get oh my ready. gosh. This is, this is pure gold. Thank you so much for enlightening us on that. Cause I'm thinking about videos that I've had. I posted one to, I have a very small following on TikTok and very few videos. Cause I sometimes don't know what to say over there, but one video I posted was just a very basic. I used to be, I'm a STEM girl at heart. That's how I let out. And I have um, a client who came to me from that, that video. And she's worked with me for a long time now. And it just is, that's something that if I could bottle that, it was just a really honest, authentic, intimate conversation that I was having with this person apparently. But I know if there's one, there have to be more people like her. And if I can tap back into the energetics of that, rather than to what I was saying, I yes. think that's the level. So we have to drop down the level, right? We can't just look at the copy or the script. We have to look at the energetics of it. And that's the wellspring of expansiveness. Absolutely. And it's, it's you just going to your profile, watching that video and feeling 100% feeling that video and just opening your energetic body to it and just allowing your energy cells to be tickled and see which ones are getting tickled and see which, yeah. It, I'm going to tickle it, my cells. <laughs> yeah, go tickle your cells, <laughs> With <Robin>. my STEM <laughs> girl video. I love it. I love it. All your videos oh are going to tickle our cells. I can't I wait. Know, I love it. I, this has been so great. What do you have coming up next for you? Well, a baby. <laughs> I know, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's like my biggest thing, honestly, is coming up, but no, as far as business goes, I am launching my podcast. I don't know when this is going live, but it will be probably launched by the time this goes live because we have our launch date set for September 5th, which is crazy because we've been working our booties off on it. And I'm super excited for because when I talk about the energetics of things like this is I, I really like I have channeled the energetics so much into this podcast and like the branding around it and like the intro every like every little thing. And um, and it, it takes a little longer it does take a little, actually a lot longer to yeah, do it that way. That's what I was going to talk about is that what I've been saying for probably the last year and a half or so is that energy work is really becoming 
a non-negotiable at this point. It's like washing your hands or brushing your teeth. And as fast movers, we think fast, we do things fast, we can dash things off in a, in a very short period of time. The energy for me is a little bit slower moving to do the energy work, to really sit with the energetics of whether it's a podcast or a video or an email and allow the energetics to unfold. There's a preciousness to it and a mindfulness to it. It cannot be rushed. Yeah. I don't think. Absolutely. I think about all the masterpieces in the world. You think they're rushing through them? No. Yeah. It's one of the hardest parts I think about being a smart girl. Maybe this happened for you, but I used to get rewarded for my last minute work. I remember I wrote a paper for my government class in undergrad. I was like a freshman in this like junior level class. I literally printed it like five minutes before I had to hand it in. (laughs) And I got an A plus on it because I had just written it like an hour before. And so I'd get rewarded for this stuff from the time I can remember. And now we're in a place where we're not getting rewarded for haste and we're not getting rewarded for, you know, dashing something off kind of flippantly, but instead being very deeply engaged with it. I think that that's where we're headed in the future. I love, I hope so. Actually, I I know so. I feel it as well. And really deeply engaged, especially with AI coming into the game and, you know, all of this. It's like the more engaged and the more in to the moment that you are with your business and the more you make it a piece of art, because it really is a piece of art, a masterpiece. Oh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at for that. Business as art. I love you. I love you. You're, oh my God. I could just talk to you all day. (laughs) Same, same. And we're going to continue the conversation. Drea, I can't wait to share this message with everybody in my community and to continue holding hands with you as we move forward into what's next in, in life. And I know on behalf of everybody, I'm so happy that you've been here with us today. What, as you're reflecting back on this part of the conversation, what are the things that stood out for you? Everything, (laughs) talking to you. Um, I would say just there's, I mean, I think this was even more powerful that we did the NEO assessment before. And there were things that I was able to connect the dots with. And now we're sitting here and I, I, again, even sharing my story for the first time since I've done the new assessments, this was a couple of days ago, but even then I'm starting to get even more incredible, beautiful connections between my story and where I am today and why I am the way I am and the why the way I am and how I operate in the world and the way I understand energy. And I think it was very, I, I know it was very confirming for me knowing the openness on my chart and, 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 and just the way I talk about energy, um, that's that's probably my biggest takeaway just the, the way i understand energy with with social media cuz um it's just you don't see that very often do you but we're going to keep having the conversation about the energetics of social media because to your point as i'm listening to you i use energy everywhere i am fucking magical in my sessions in in private you know you we've spent time oh, yeah. or even just in conversation and it makes me really curious about what's possible in social, in email, in, in the conversations that I'm having energetically with people and um, wondering how I can expand into that because it's a new space for me. So, you know, my business is largely referral based at this point, as are many of my clients or the, and my listeners also have referral based businesses. And, but we all know we've got bigger callings and, and we want more people to hear the messages. And the energy, I really, truly believe is a way to do that. Yeah. It's our responsibility to share with as many people as possible. I really, it is. is. I think that in this noisy, noisy place that we live in, where our consciousness is a commodity at this point, when you have a message to share, you have a responsibility to be a beacon of hope in a pretty dark place right now. And I know that you're doing that and that's my mission as well. So, yeah. Thanks for being a bright light. Thank you. You too, Robin. You're amazing. (laughs) Thank you so much. And everybody, thanks again for joining us on this episode. And I will see you next time.